Welcome back. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more attention in this video and talk about how attention is generated and shifted. So there are actually two main types of attention that are worth discussing. Endogenous attention is attention that is directed toward aspects of the environment in keeping with the interests and goals of the individual. So this is also thought of as top-down processing. So we're actually consciously directing our attention to certain things. So if I'm reading a paper, I'm consciously directing my attention onto that paper in order to read it. There's also ex exogenous attention, which is the involuntary reorienting of attention toward a stimulus source that is cued by an object or an event. So this is bottom-up processing. Essentially what this is, is it's when there's something in the environment that grabs your attention. So if the fire alarm went off right now, I would stop paying attention to recording the video and pay attention to that alarm and what it means. So that would be exogenous attention. It's when something involuntarily reorients you to it and your attention is reoriented. So in the symbolic queuing test, which you see over here, it measures the reaction time to a stimulus that is preceded by a hint as to the location of where it will appear. As such, it is a measure of the effect of endogenous top-down processing. The cues presented may be either valid or invalid. The effects on reaction time are then averaged and compared with neutral trials when no hint is presented. Results have found that uh, reaction times were significantly faster for queued versus unqueued trials when the subject doesn't have to move their eyes to the queued location, suggesting that the top-down processing does aid reaction time. So if it's a valid queue like this where I'm told to look to the right, so I looked over to the right and it pops up there, that does improve my reaction time. So we see reaction time lower for the valid than it is for the neutral. Uh, further, one thing that's interesting is incorrect Q trials where it tells me it's going to be um, on you know, the left and it's actually on the right, actually showed a 20% reduction in response time indicating that there's a price that's paid for having to shift one's attention from the original Q. So translated, if you're misled by the Q, it significantly impairs your reaction time. So we can see that having a cue that's accurate increases reaction time, one that doesn't decreases. So if you have endogenous attention, if you are directing your attention based on the cue, it helps as long as the cue is valid and it's faster than exogenous. So hopefully that made sense. So with this, what would the results look like if you're strictly bottom-up processing, if you're strictly exogenous. Well, if you're strictly exogenous, then no one would, you would expect no difference with the Q. So this supports that endogenous um, attention shifting. The peripheral spatial queuing test has been used to examine exogenous attention, where external events direct our attention. The peripheral spatial queuing test measures latency to detect a visual stimulus when it is either when it's preceded by a irrelevant stimulus in the same location. So for example, a sound may be presented either on the side that the queue will be on or on the other side, and then there is a delay. What's interesting is that as you can see here um, in the in the diagram, the queue doesn't matter much as far as whether it's valid or invalid, as long as there isn't a long wait before one answers. However, if it's around 150 milliseconds or longer of a delay, then there is a dispersion. This phenomenon is called inhibition of return, um, which is that longer intervals interfere with processing of valid cues. The thought is that being able to move on or yeah, the thought is that being able to move on and being hesitant to return makes attention more resistant to distraction. So if you were queued one place and didn't end up being valid, 
you're going to be more hesitant to go back to that same place. So hopefully then the same distraction doesn't keep distracting you as the thought. So this is an example of bottom-up processing, given that the cues aren't affecting accuracy and that external factors, i.e. the delay, affect cognitive processing. So what we see is overall exogenous and endogenous attention work together. Uh, they both have strengths and they both seem to drive attention. And also an exogenous attentional cue in one modality can of course improve detention, detection of a stimulus in another modality. Visual attention usually involves searching for items in a picture. There are two tasks that are typically used for this, feature search and conjunction search. Feature search is when you search based upon only one attribute, such as a shape or a color, um, which is what you see here. So feature search requires little attention because um, the individual is about equally as fast at this task regardless of whether or not there are distractors. So it's a pretty easy task. Conjunction search is a little bit more difficult as it requires one to find an object that meets two or more criterion, such as finding a red circle. This type of search requires more attention and thus performance is impaired when distractors are present. So how does one put these two pieces together in order to identify the target, especially when many of these processing centers are in different parts of the brain? This is known as the binding problem. And one theory to tackle it is fe the feature integration theory. In this theory, it is essentially a bottom-up processing where there are sequential shifts of attention that are required to take in the whole map, and then the upper level brain regions integrate the information in order to find the answer. Thus, our attention gathers all the information um, of what shapes and colors are in the picture, and the upper regions of the cortex, which handle more complex planning and cognition, put together the, the information in order to identify the red circles. So neuroimaging combined with EEG has demonstrated changes in activation in the brain, um, and especially in different brain regions that are correlated with attentional shifts. So put differently, we know that different brain regions appear to be associated with shifting attention. However, what we know is that really finding the neurological basis of attention is extremely challenging because attention is a very diffuse process, meaning that you see activity in many different areas of the brain. However, through use of neuroimaging, um, we've been able to enhance the temporal resolution of the imaging, and with this, um, a few brain regions have been particularly implicated in attention. These have primarily been identified through looking at changes in brain activity, again, when attention changes. So we don't, there's still a lot we don't know about attention, but here's what we do know based upon the latest imaging and EEG results. The book's explanation of this is fairly long and convoluted, so I'm going to do my best to present the Cliff Notes version, but I really recommend you take notes on the coming slides. So the superior um, nucleus is active in many attentional activities. It seems to be important along with the LGN and sustained attention. It is also important in creating the attentional eye movements that are required when you're visually searching for something. The pulvinar, which is the back quarter of the thalamus, is heavily involved in visual processing, especially when orienting and shifting uh, one's attention. When this area is deactivated, monkeys show difficulty orienting to exogenous visual stimuli. The intraparietal sulcus is important for endogenous attention, or the attention that we control, so the attention that we consciously control. 
And when we mess with this area using TMS, we find that humans are unable to voluntarily direct their attention. So it seems, again, very important for that um, endogenous voluntary control of attention. The frontal eye field is part of the frontal lobe of the brain and has been studied because individuals who have lesions here struggle with present, or preventing their eyes from moving toward distracting irrelevant stimuli. Thus, we believe this area is important for establishing and maintaining gaze. Lastly, the temporoparietal junction, which of course is where the temporal and parietal lobes meet up, appears to be important for shifting one one's attention to a new target after it appears. Thus, if something is happening in your peripheral vision that catches your attention and you turn your attention to see what's going on, that is your temporal parietal junction. These brain regions that we discussed are grouped into two primary systems, the dorsal frontal parietal and the right temporal parietal. The dorsal frontal parietal system is important for top-down endogenous control of attention. Thus, the intraparietal sulci, or sulcus rather, and the frontal eye field are both part of this system. The right temporal parietal system is responsible for exogenous attention, and thus the brain areas such as the temporal parietal junction um, that are important for exogenous attention are included in this system. So again, just to um, just to review, dorsal frontal parietal is endogenous, so the attention that we control, and right temporal parietal is exogenous, which is where something in the environment draws our attention elsewhere. While it's nice to think of these as two different systems, in actuality there's a ton of overlap between the two, and information is shared between the two. Thus, a new model is combining the two and thinking of um, each type of processing as a stream, with the dorsal stream focusing more on endogenous um, attention and the ventral stream more exogenous attention. However, as you can likely tell, there's still much we have to learn about attention about, and about how all these brain regions interplay to create the world we experience.